Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type. Could be sins of the tongue or overt. Carnality. How to get out of carnality and back to the indwelling ministry called spirituality of the Holy Spirit. Confession of sin. A scripture. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That cleansing goes to the work of the cross of Jesus Christ where he shed his blood for the remission of sin. On the one hand, for salvation, it's Adam's sin, and for the believer, it's personal sin. Adam's sin, the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin are removed at the point of believing the gospel. That Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes in Romans 1.16. Therefore, we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. So I give you a moment of silence to, as a believer priest to confess your personal sin to the Lord. That's where it's been committed against. And let him restore spirituality in your life through confession. And so, our Father, we're thankful today for the opportunity and freedom. A volitional choice, whether we come to church. We're practicing as much as we know how. What they call social distancing, which is really difficult in the South and especially in the church. But we've been good soldiers to the law of the land. At some point, Father, the law of the land will become obvious, corrupt, and then we'll walk by the word as we always should against the law of the land when it interferes even with our rights in a symbol. Constitutionally, in our Constitution, thank you, Father, for that. And we'll be faithful to do that. If there's anybody that should be an essential in times of crisis, it should be the church, and the church should be operational. Teach us that, Father. Teach us that well. We're, we're not of the world. We're in it, but not of it. Teach us that. We don't live by fear. We live by faith. We've discovered over the months, Father, we don't live by facts. They produce fear because they keep changing with the wind. Not so with God and not so with his word. May we be followers of that for our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. I mentioned last time in our study of the life of Elijah that there were two Sidonian women that influenced, had an enormous influence upon uh, Elijah's life. We're going to meet one of those two women today, today and next week. And she's known as the widow of Zarephath. And all of the historical mention of this lady, even by Jesus, we do not know her name. She is nameless except in the book of life, her name, I suppose, is recorded there, like your name and mine. And she's an interesting character in the life of Elijah. The, we, in our last study, we, Elijah had, had been told to go to the brook and stay there and tell further instructions. He stayed there three years, sometime during a early part of the third year, just about the time he got comfortable in his place by the brook, God told him, we're going to move. And there's a good lesson for you there, for all of us. Don't get comfortable in your comfort zone. That's not what it's for. It's a time of refreshing to refuel you to the work of the Lord. Nothing more. You're going, to learn that from, you're going to learn that from Elijah. Never get comfortable in the comfort zone. 
So it's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. We all have those periods when we're in R&R, rest and relaxation. That's not what it's about. You get it, but that's not what it's about. It's about refueling and retraining for the work of the Lord. He's about to give you a little R&R so he can put you on a dead run. You're going to see it in the life of Elijah. He, he's going to do that, and he's, he's kicked it up. See, when he's at the brook, there was nobody but he and the Lord. Now he's going into public. He's going into people. He's told to go to the city, to leave the brook and go to the city. The city that's located on the seacoast between Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia. He's told to go back. I want you to go back and get, get among people again. And so he does. He shows up at the gate of the city. That's the public square. That'd be like, I'm going to meet you at, uh, well, the summit or someplace like that and tell you where. It would be the gate of the city. As he shows up at the gate of the city, and guess who he meets? The first person he meets in the city. The widow. Now, there are other people there, apparently, because it's the gate of the city. A lot of shops are probably closed down because of the drought that's in Israel is affecting them. Jesus tells us that when he talks about this widow in Luke 4. I hope you read that. Well, one of the great principles that is being repeated in his life that's being repeated in our life by the study is logistical grace. There's saving grace and logistical grace. There's growing grace. You know, like 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge. See, that's those two. There's suffering grace. There's dying grace. There's surpassing grace. These are all highlights of grace. These are kind of like the highlights, six stages of grace that you should be very familiar with. And that's not all there is. That's a lot. And here we are in a study of logistical grace, and you're going to see saving grace come out of it. God takes them away from the brook and the ravens and puts them in the city with people. Time to go back to work. And he, he gets his feet wet at Zarephath to go back to Israel and lower the hammer after three years of drought. Logistical grace, if Philippians 4.19 for you and I, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches. See, we often miss that. You know what, what, it, you know what Elijah was getting when ravens were bringing the morning meal and the evening meal from the t king's table to him? He was getting part of the riches of the glory of Christ. When you get logistical grace... It's not just for you. It's a time of refreshing and refueling your relationship in logistical grace. You are experiencing some of the riches of the grace of God. And it's not for you and it's not about you. It's about what God has a desire for your life about. It's your destiny in the Lord. And logistical grace is supplied not by whether you're poor or rich. It's all based on the riches of Christ. Read that again. Read that again. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's what it's about. That is what it's about. The manna was never about the manna. The raven food was never about the raven food. And the widow is about to learn the same lesson in logistical grace. God will supply. That's why the glory goes to him. And how does he do it? He does it out of the riches of his grace. Because he's your father and he cares about you and he takes care of you in the most unique and special ways. Note that logistical grace involves three people and their wills. 
In this story, there are three people with three wills, and all of them are involved in the story. There is God's will. That's who's sending Elijah to Zarephath. God's will. That's called the directive will of God. And everything is going to fall under that order of business. There is God's will. God's will is supreme. It should be in your life. You should be making decisions off from the will of God. Well, how has God directed you in the choices you're about to make? Now, look, you got to study the Bible to know that. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So, there's God's will. Then there's Elijah's will. God says to him, we're, we're pulling up from where we are. We're leaving the brook, and we're going to Zarephath. We're going to a, a completely different nation. Now, he knows where this is. It's a famous, this is like Panama City. Gulf Shores. <laughs> this is what this is like. So we have positive volition with the directive will of God. He pulls up stake and he leaves. He leaves his comfort zone. His comfort zone was never for comfort. It was for training without distractions. You got to learn that. You got to learn that. They say everything is not about you, but everything is about him. You think everything is about you, and it's not. You don't even belong to yourself anymore. You've been bought. You've been purchased in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your life doesn't belong to you anymore. And you should be thankful for that. You've been bought. What do you think Christ died on the cross for? So you could get saved, get your name put in the book, and then live the way you want to live? That's not the Christian life. Your choices should always be compatible with the directive will of God. Otherwise, you're going to be the most miserable people in your walk with the Lord. Things are never going to go your way. You're always going to be in an uproar. You're always going to be upset. You're always going to be huffing and puffing. Well... We got God's will. We've got Elijah's will. He stays positive. He pulls up stake and he leaves. We have the widow of Zarephath's will. She's positive to God consciousness. Here is an unbeliever, a widow, a Gentile, a Gentile. God pulls him up, doesn't send him back to Israel the land of the Jews. He sends him to the land of the Gentiles. To a widow who has positive devotion towards God. And the reason he does is because there's no positive devotion towards God in Israel. That's why they're under the second, second cycle. There is, but they're not public. There are 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. But everybody else, those who are, they're underground. Elijah didn't even know they existed in 7,000. He had no idea the number had grown to that number. But what was, what, who were making decisions on the surface were negative to God. They were worshipers of Baal. Those who weren't worshipped of Baal went underground. You know why? Because of persecution. Ahab's persecution. He persecuted those who were believers who didn't worship Baal. If you didn't worship Baal, you got isolated. You're, you're, it was a state-run religion. Study history. Everyone, everyone winds up bad no matter how they started. They all wind up bad because it's not part of protocol. Well, most of you know this stuff. And so we got God's will. We got Elijah submitting his to it. And we got the widow who is interested in God, the God of Israel. She's interested in the God of Israel. She's tired of polytheistic 
beliefs that don't pan out. They're <laughs> pantheistic. They don't pan out. All right? And listen, she's going to operate as an unbeliever, positive to God consciousness. She's going to operate out of a basic principle of hospitality. Now think about that. That's an Eastern custom. In the South, we say, y'all come back whether we mean it or not. <laughs> it's called courtesy. It's hospitality. We will also learn from Elijah's travel to Zarephath that the second of divine discipline of Leviticus 26, 18 through 20 has affected Phoenicia as well as Israel, the North Kingdom. So let's take a look at four things this morning in this hour. Elijah's meeting with the first woman called the widow of Zarephath. The first thing you have to know is this nation that he's been sent to. The Phoenician nation. The Phoenician nation had taken on the Canaanite. You see, the Baal worship came from the Canaanite nations. Israel, the whole land of Israel was Canaanite. Canaanite, and it worshipped a system in that, a system of polytheistic beliefs of gods. In that system was a major one, a major religion in that group was Baal worship. The Phoenicians, they made it a state religion just like Israel did. They could have chose many different, many different idolatry systems in this seven nations group of people. But the one that caught everybody's attention and was hot, hot on fire at the time of Elijah was Baal worship. And the national government under Ahab had put Baal worship in, and it was also the state religion of the Phoenician people. Baal worship. As a result, Phoenicia is a heathen nation. It's a heathen nation. If the church of Jesus Christ is not awakening during this spiritual awakening opportunity that we have right now called COVID-19, which has swept the world, not just America, this is how you know you've got something that is a spiritual awakening movement that needs to start. If the church of Jesus Christ does not wake up and start it, we're going to wind up a heathen nation. Tell me you don't see it in a movement in our nation already. Anti-God, anti-Christianity, all re other religions go but Christianity. Hello? Listen, w we don't even... This, listen, we let other nations come to win them to Christ. Saves us from going to them. Because there's no power greater than the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. There's no contest with these people, nor with their religion. It's whether or not we're willing to go and share the gospel. Listen, God don't bring these people to our nation for no reason. Listen, he either brings, you to the, brings people to the gospel, America, or he takes the gospel to them. This is the way it works. This is how it all works. You ought to read Acts 2 and apply that principle. When you have 15 different languages from different nations at Pentecost, when the church began and began to send missionaries. I'm just telling you. I mean, some of this you don't know because you don't read. I mean, I can't help that. Jesus remarks about this meeting. Jesus talks about the meeting in Luke 4, 24 through 26. He talks about the meeting with the, with the widow of Zarephath. And one of the things he said that I noted in my introduction, when a, he, Jesus said that he met her, when a great famine had come over the land. The land, it swept the Canaanite land. That whole Canaanite land 
has been, has been put under the same curse because they're under the same, listen, they're under the same heathenism. And God is starting, uh, is try, trying to start a fire for a, a spiritual awakening in this land, the land that has now become known as the land of Israel. So, the national God, here's why ba ba the worship of Baal became so prominent of all the other idolatrous systems. Their national God, Baal, was a Canaanite God of the storm and rain. Remember that. Do not forget that. Do they get none of that? Their God has given them nothing for three years. You understand? This is their God that they worship. The God of Baal is the God of storm and rain. Agricultural, that's the name of the game. This is important to remember that in the study of the life of Elijah. Here's the point. The central appeal. How did Baal win over all the other idolatrous rel religious ideas? Here it is. The central appeal of Baal worship was the phallic cult, temple prostitution, demonic sensuality. That was it. Isn't the devil, isn't he, isn't he slick? Sex. It gets more people in the church over it, let alone the world, because it's a, a primal, it's a primal instinct lust. It appeals to all ages. Moses had problems with these people, and he warned the Israelites of Baal, against Baal worship of the Canaanite in Deuteronomy 6, 12 through 15. Jeremiah, he warns the worshipers of Baal in Israel not to sacrifice their children to fire. Can you imagine that? There's a commercial on television where these two guys stand and the guy jumps off into, this is Baal worship. It's exactly what Baal worship was because they did it to children. Every time I see that, I cringe because... That's human sacrifice. I don't care what the cause is. That's a bad ad. Does that not bother you to see that ad? And then the guy hold out his hand for water? That's Baal. That bothers the stew out of me that anybody would have come up with that. You know, I've got a television that got more channels than Carter's got liver pills. And I watch two. The rest of them aren't worth watching. Now that I, I usually watch three, but I don't have any sports anymore. I watch three channels. And most of the time, I don't watch any of them. I put on my old records, old records. I can't even stand modern music anymore. Jeremiah warns them in Jeremiah 19.5. You're familiar with this, those of you who are historians of the Bible. There were many widows in Egypt, Jesus said, in Israel. Jesus says in Luke 4, there were many widows in Israel, yet God sent Elijah to a widow of Zarephath because of positive volition and a God consciousness, which Israel didn't have. I'm talking about the populace. And he sent him. And Jesus makes mention of that. Jesus made. Yet Elijah, 426 of Luke, yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sion, to a woman who was a widow. There's our lesson for the day. Isn't that interesting? 
And it's interesting how, how he identified her. Now, she's at Zarephath, which is a city on its own. Tyra. There were four major cities in uh, Phoenicia. Three of them are mentioned. But she's identified. Jesus identified her with Sidon. And that is so important. Because both of these ladies are Sidonian. That we're going to talk about. I'm talking about one today. Remember that Baal worship was a state-run religion. Never forget that. State-run religion. As a result of her positive volition at God consciousness, you know, she reminds me so much of Rahab. Remember Rahab? I mean, she sat in this zone with positive volition towards God. And God took her out of it, didn't he? Put her in Matthew, the first chapter. <laughs> this widow is very similar to her. Very similar to her. Listen, he sends it to a woman who is positive volition towards God because God is required to give her gospel hearing. He's, he's either got to send somebody to her or her to somebody that can give her the information that she can be saved by grace through faith and not of herself the gift of God. You know how she got saved? She got saved. Jesus talks about it. You know how she got saved? Now listen to me. Galatians 3.8. Apparently, you know that verse. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it, seriously. You should. You know what it says? The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles. Hello? Would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. You're in Genesis 12. And quotes verse 3. All the nations will be blessed in you, not Abraham, Christ. Galatians 3.16. The seed of Abraham. You know how Abraham got saved? By believing a prophetic gospel that Christ would come, die on a cross for sins, be buried and raised on the dead, from the dead on the third day. That's how he got saved. You know how this woman's going to get saved? Everybody in the Old Testament got saved the same way, a prophetic gospel. You know how you get saved? A historical gospel. Christ came, died on a hill called Golgotha. We know the date, the time, the place, and everything was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Let me tell you, there's so much information in Galatians 3.8. The scriptures, he's talking about, the, he's talking about Genesis 12.3. Genesis 12.3. Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel. And here he is with Elijah with a, a, a Sidonian woman. It's just so phenomenal. It's so phenomenal. Listen, God, and we learn that God is responsible for anybody with positive listening of God conscious. He'll either send us to them or them to us who have the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He couldn't send anybody. He sent Elijah. Somebody who could preach a clear gospel. Guys who have a clear gospel and know they have a clear gospel and are bold with that clear gospel and not ashamed of that clear gospel, God sends. And they need to be faithful to preach it when they get there. You take, the, you take your licks for it. That's called undeserved suffering for Christ's sake. But don't you back down from that. Positive volition, that's a PV on your paper. 
PV, positive volition, that God consciousness does not constitute salvation. Just because you believe in God don't mean you're saved. That's the starting place. It's not the ending place. It takes Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. I am, I am the truth, the way, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. You're not saved because you believe in God. That's a starting point. To be saved, you have to believe that Jesus came, died on a cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Then you get saved. Positive volition towards the gospel is what saves you, not positive volition. Positive volition toward God is what brings the gospel to you. The gospel of grace, salvation by faith and not of yourself is a gift. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 1.8. God dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. See, it takes two. God consciousness, positive listening, God consciousness brings gospel hearing. Gospel hearing brings you to a place where you must believe it to be saved. Don't listen to all this foolishness. All the devil wants to do is damn your soul like his is and uh, wind up in a lake of fire. Revelation 20. Listen, 2 Peter 3, 9. Why is God doing this? God, listen, it's very simple. God is not willing that any would perish. That's why we go. When we think God is sending us somewhere, you know why we go? Because God is not willing that any perish. And we have to have that same mental attitude. That he's not willing that any perish. But that all would come to repentance. But somebody's got to go tell them. You know, go tell it on the mountain. Remember that? Actually, that was my marching order to go to Pine Mountain. Go tell it on the mountain. I did. Let me show it to you. The doctrinal principle under verse under point two. God will bring the person with positive volition of God consciousness to gospel hearing. Listen, he did it with the Ethiopian and Philip in the story eight. Remember that? The Ethiopian had come to Pentecost, to the national holiday of the Jews, had heard about this Jesus Christ that died on the cross for his sins, buried and raised, couldn't put it all together. Nobody could explain it. He had them all, but he couldn't fit it together. He had point one, two, and three, but couldn't get him in order. Philip, on his way to Samaria, a great evangelism, and then on to preach the gospel, on his way, the Holy Spirit said, take this road. He went, no, nah, that's not a good, that's, that would take me off my path. He said, take that road. Well, it, 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 it's no way to get back. I would have to go down the road, then come back and go. Why would I do that? No, you just do it because I tell you to do it. So he did. What a faithful person. That's called walking in the spirit, by the way. That's called walking in the spirit. He gets down there and he finds a chariot. The spirit of God says, let's talk to him. He said, well, he's got both wheels on. I don't see why I need to stop. I don't see anything wrong with it. I t because I tell you to stop and let's talk. Okay. That's called walking. It says, no, no doubt. No, it's says, okay to question it. But in the end, you got to do what he tells you to do. Do you not know how to be led by the Spirit or guided by the Spirit? You ought to go to my Wednesday studies. Go to my Wednesday studies. Quench not the Spirit. I'm teaching on this. How to be led and how to be guided by the Holy Spirit. So he talks to the Ethiopian and leads him to the Lord because he can't put it together. He's got the ideas, but he can't put them together. How does this actually work where I can be saved? And he explains it to him. See, that's God trying to reach. God is not willing that any perish, not one. Isn't that interesting? It is to me. See, it always boils down to the one, the one, the whosoever believes. I struggle with that to come to Christ. I struggled with that. I finally gave it up. But I did struggle with it. 
He will bring the person to the gospel, or he will take the gospel to the, pe to the person or the people, pockets of people. That's Jonah and the Ninevites. Jonah and the Ninevites. Now he's going to send Elijah all the way over to the Phoenicians for one woman who's going to get saved like Rahab or like the woman at the well. The woman of the well. Isn't that an interesting story? Jesus goes to the woman at the well. She gets saved. She goes back to her city, Sychar, and the whole city saved. From a person with positive volition to a people, a pocket, a pocket of positive volition, and you have a citywide salvation swept through the whole city. That's John 4. You know who did that? God. Her spiritual awakening started a spiritual awakening. That's how it works. You know where that was? Not Israel. Samaria. It wasn't in Jerusalem or Judea. It wasn't there. No, no. They were crucifying everybody they could get a hold of that was connected to Christ. They just put him in jail. They were doing what they could do against it. No, no. But in Samaria. How about that? Samaria. Another Gentile concept. Not in the true sense of a Gentile, but a concept. This is what Elijah is dealing with in our story with the woman, the widow. God is willing to save every person who will believe no matter who he is, no matter where he is, no matter how he's lived. If he will believe the gospel. You say, oh, Ron, I, I've made so many mistakes in my life. Listen to me. Those of you that are listening by the internet, listen to me. The devil would like to say, you can never climb out. You can never climb out of your mess that you've got your life in. You've destroyed everybody around you. Nobody will have anything else to do with you. You're going to die on the street homeless and helpless, a miserable, miserable person of society. That's not true. God loves you and sent his son to die on a cross, be buried and raised to the dead, to pull you out of the muck and mire of the filth of the world and put you, redress you and clean you up and make you a new person in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You're not going to be a new creation sitting in the muck and mire of the filth of the world. Read Luke 15 and the story of the prodigal son. God brought him back and dressed him up like he ought to be. Royalty in Christ. Royalty in Christ. Look what he was when, he, when the Lord picked him up. In a pig pen. Acting like a pig. He had digressed, he had digressed his humanity into a pig. He looked like a pig. He snorted like a pig, he ate like a pig, he smelt like a pig, and he thought he was becoming a pig until he came to his senses and said, I'm not a pig. You're not what the people call you. You're not even what you call yourself. If you want to be saved, come out of that mess. Believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Come out of that mess. By the grace of God. I hope somebody's listening. God is not willing that one, anyone perish. That's my message for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to restore your life. Nobody else has that power. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, he restores you spiritually in the wholeness and the image of Jesus Christ, his beloved son. Think about that. 
The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter how the world has viewed you, no how bad or bad you have viewed yourself, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get regenerated, you get born again, you are born in the image of Jesus Christ that day. You bear the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very beloved Son of God. You're no longer your own. You've been bought. The world had bought you. The world has bought you. God wants to purchase you. That's called salvation. He wants to purchase you and give you a new life in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Oh, are you listening to me today? We can start a spiritual awakening. If one Samaritan will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can reach a city, we can reach a, a nation, we can take it to the nations of the world. That's Matthew 28. I'm just saying, you waiting for somebody else to do it? Waiting for somebody else to do it? You waiting for somebody else to do it? If you are, if you are, you're way behind. The bo you're way behind. Listen to point three: personal heathenism. Personal heathenism occurs when a person completely rejects the conviction work of the Holy Spirit regarding grace salvation recorded in John sixteen seven through eleven. The gospel. The gospel is the only point of salvation. Grace salvation. The moment a person believes the gospel, that person is saved by grace through non-meritorious thinking called faith. Romans 1.16. We are ambassadors for Christ. See, I'm a guy who likes to know, I'm a Paul Harvey fan. Paul Harvey. I know you don't know Paul Harvey. But I'm a Paul Harvey fan. I like page two. I'm a page two guy. So when I, when I meet a story like the widow of Zarephath Zara and Jesus talks about her, I get a book in my head. I want to write the story about the widow who became that Samaritan woman, that fire lit in her by the gospel of Jesus Christ who takes the gospel forward into her nation. Okay. Austin, that's how I think. There's a story for you. Start with a Samar Samaritan woman at the well and find how many other women did the same thing. God lit a fire in their soul of the greatness of his salvation and they took it to their friends and family and neighbors and God set a fire of the gospel. Ambassadorship, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as through God, as though God was making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ is our appeal. Be reconciled to God. He, God, made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is our appeal to the unbeliever as an ambassador, and there's our appeal. You want to have a spiritual awakening? You want to see your nation come back to some kind of sensible glory day? Light of fire. Be an ambassador for Christ with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to stand up. Get out of your comfort zone and talk to the widow of Zarephath. That's my appeal. In closing, when Elijah arrived at the gate of the city of Zarephath, he met this widow of Zarephath. She was gathering up sticks to cook her last meal for her and her son and die. That was her plan. How would you like to have that plan? How would you like to start your week that way? I'm going out to pick up some sticks, build a fire, and cook my last, my last piece of morsel I have to my name. 
And I have more than a lot of people. But uh, my end has come like the rest of my people, death, starvation. I'm going to eat my last meal with my child, and we're going to die. That sound like a great plan to you? Now, you think as a parent, how would you like to have that be your great plan for your family? Most of us want them to go to college and fund it and want them to have a great life and have a marriage and have grandkids for us. Want to have a good, decent life. How about being a parent? And you're in a national crisis. And everybody around you is dying and you've got your last morsel that you're going to cook. And you and your child are going to eat it and you're going to lay down and you're going to die. Listen, this is the story of Africa. Not a seaport, Mediterranean, not a Mediterranean seaport that's hotter than a pistol, pistol economically, normally. Where people invest, ships come in and go. Not anymore. Everything's dried up. What a plan this lady has. Listen to what her plan is, the end of hope. Boy, let me tell you, when you're at the end of hope, humanly speaking, there's no, no other place to go, is there? How bad do you think that is for a mother to know she's going to cook the last meal, lay down with her child, put, her, put, her in, put that baby in her arms and die? This is the woman to whom Elijah has met at the gate, whom God has sent to rescue her because she has positive listening and God consciousness. Who will go? God has these people all over us. They're in your neighborhood. They're in the places you do business. They're all over. God sends us to them, and we don't even pay any attention to them. Let them die. Listen. The worst death she will die is not without Christ. It's not without food. That's an easy death without food. To die without Christ is to have no hope in the next life. God is not willing that one perish. But who will go? Who will go? A young man the other day knocked on my door. He says, you have a security system? I said, one of the best in the world. <laughs> he said, well, I didn't see any evidence of one. Oh, I said, what kind of security system are you talking about? He says, well, I'm, I sell cameras. and uh, Oh, would you like to come in the house and tell me about your security system? He said, yeah. I said, well, wait. And he put his hand on my door. I said, well, wait a minute. When you get through talking about yours, can I talk about mine? He said, well, I'd like to hear all about yours. Because I think I got a good one. Oh, I said, I bet you do. And I want to hear every bit about it because I got one of the best. This young man was from Utah. I could have wept. God would send a young man from Utah to my door. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Utah. So I had my opportunity to tell him about my great security system that works in time and eternity, one that goes from, from earth to heaven. <laughs> Will yours work in heaven? No, sir, it won't. Mine will. And mine don't cost a thing. How much yours cost? Well, it ain't free. Mine is. What about yours? No, nope, mine is. What about yours? No, nope, mine is. 
I thought, how privileged I was that God would send a young man from Utah to my door that I could share the gospel with Jesus Christ. I didn't have to go to Utah. He sent me Utah to me. And I'm so privileged to know that. See, I can't talk about your life. I know you do it. I can only talk about mine because I do it. I don't do it because I'm a pastor. I do it because I'm born again. I'm born again. I don't think anything happens by chance or coincidence. I believe it's all orchestrated by God. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And I don't, I, don't, I don't regret it and I don't begrudge it. I try to live it the best I can. I do it because I'm an ambassador. I don't do it because, listen, this guy came in and left, didn't know I was a preacher. I didn't pull my credit card out, says I'm a pastor. I get 10% off, don't I? I didn't do that. I never do that. Well, he, he arrives at the, and she's at her last. And the Lord our God, listen, 1712, and the Lord our God lives. She, this is her testimony to him when he meets her. As the Lord, your God lives. As the Lord, I can't tell you how important that is. Circle that. As the Lord, your God lives. That's the God of Israel. I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl, I have a little oil in the jar, and behold, anytime you see that behold, that's, pay attention. I'm gathering a few sticks that I might go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat and die. What a terrible plan. What a terrible plan that is. Because, listen, if she has no hope in Christ, listen, she has no hope in life apart from Christ. She dies. She's got no hope in eternity. Well, listen to me, Internet. But listen, something wonderful is going to happen in her life today. The beginning of something great. This is, the, I hope that somebody in my congregation gets this today or somebody on the Internet gets this. If you're without hope, I've got a new day coming for you. The beginning of something great. So she, listen, he says to her, I want a drink of water. She said, I can get that. They she said, bring me, a, bring me some bread with that. <laughs> That's when she says, uh-uh. I don't have enough for me and my boy. We're going to eat it and die, sir. Whatever brought you to this city ought to take you home. Whatever, listen. You've walking in, if you're walking in Zarephath, you're walking, walking into a morgue. Whatever brought you to the city, you better turn around and go back because everybody's dying in the city. This is a city called death. He says to her, go get, go bring it to me. You will never go hungry. <laughs> because my God will supply all of your needs. If you will listen to me today, you will hook up with God where you can say, my God will supply all my needs according to the riches of his, glo of his gl glory in Christ. Logistical grace works for the believer in the most marvelous ways. So she went. <laughs> so she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. The bread, the bowl of flour was never exhausted according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Ain't God wonderful? Listen, suppose Elijah had not gone. Wouldn't this be a miserable story? Elijah had no idea that she would, this was going to be the last day of her life. When he showed up on her doorstep, so to speak, it was the last day of her life. Huh? 
the last day of her life. Actually, the last day of her life became the first day of her life because she got saved. She believed that Christ would come one day and die for her sins, be buried and raised from the dead third day, and she believed it. That's why Jesus records her name in his book. What a wonderful story. Let me close with this idea. I'd write this down if it's important. God uses unlikely people and resources to accomplish his will and to accomplish his plan through positive volition in faith to the directive will of God. One more time. Apparently it's important to you. It was important to me. I didn't put it on any paper because God gave it to me on the way. God uses unlikely people and resources. He used the raven one time. Remember the ravens? Now he's used a widow on her last day on the earth. God uses unlikely people and resources to accomplish his will and to accomplish his plan through positive volition by means of faith to the directive will of God. In faith to the directive will of God. What a wonderful story, people. Are we those? Can we not be Elijah's? Can we not be bold and go? Not knowing where and why and all the circumstances. Why do we have to know all that before we go? When we get there, they'll all be revealed to us, won't it? Be all revealed. <laughs> you never know when somebody wants to sell you a security system who don't have one. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you for Elijah, bold, to do the will of God. Step out of his comfort zone. Go to a far city that was a city of death when he got there. Met the woman of Zarephath in her last day of life. Was able to bring new life to her and to her community. Don't you know, she had a wonderful story to tell her people. How this didn't have to be the last day of their life. They could believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead and have life everlasting. Not only life everlasting, but to John 10, 10, life abundantly here and now. If God is not willing to any perish, he's certainly not willing for the believer to perish outside the directive will. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson to our, our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.